First of all, I, I, I have to say that I'm a novice uh, in, in applying this technique, and, uh, um, but we just uh, start in our laboratory here in Padua in uh, using this technique in a new experimental work. And uh, so today I will mainly um, present on the works uh, that involve the, the use of the technique in clinical uh, situations. But I will start in a very simplistic fashion with an overview of electromyography, please avoiding, uh, I will try to avoid to repeat uh, what has been already uh, presented very well by, by Dario. Uh, substantially, as you know, electromyography is a very um, used technique in many different fields from sports science, uh, rehabilitation, uh, kinesiology. And um, in the past has been evolving, especially the concept, the idea of the use of the traditional surface EMG, because uh, as uh, presented in many papers, including this seminal uh, work by uh, Dario Farina, Merletti, and Enoka, that is, uh, I believe is, is also present in this conference, we know that the surface EMG presents a number of uh, limitations, at least the traditional one, uh, for instance, used by, uh, by bipolar uh, configuration. For instance, cancellation of a positive and negative uh, model unit potential, difference in body composition, the, the layer covering the muscle, the distance from the electrodes, uh, from, the, from the muscle fibers, and in, in regard to the motor point, the cross torque, and uh, the electrode sides, are all, all these uh, features are making the surface EMG limited uh, in the traditional uh, fashion. For instance, this is a, another work by uh, Viera and Botter indicating that probably, and that we tend to agree with this, the, the main application of the traditional EMG is to uh, investigate the timing and degree of muscle excitation, the on-off in many circumstances. We need to, to consider this. And uh, I, I apply this uh, old tradition technique for many years. Now I know that this is a, it's a quite a limitation and we need to move forward. One, uh, I couldn't resist to put this, uh, this paper <laughs> into the presentation. One, uh, one improvement of the surface, it was the use of linear array electrodes that were positioned in parallel to the muscle fibers. In this way, for instance, you can improve the selectivity of the recording because you can do a double different differential uh, analysis of the, the, the signal, so restraining the, the fields. But this is a technique, again, limited to small area of the muscle. But uh, for this technique, for instance, we measured some years ago very proficiently muscle fiber conduction velocity, that is a, a model recruitment uh, parameter because it's, it's based on muscle fiber conduction velocity is, is re related to the muscle volume. So you can estimate the recruitment, the recruitment um, conditions by, uh, by measuring this parameter. We, we were, were able to measure this even during dynamic condition from 45 revolution per minute on a bike up to 120 revolution per minute. So you see in this slide, uh, you have the, the array position in parallel to the, to the muscle fiber. In this case, we use a vasus lateralis, a vasus medialis muscle for, uh, as, a, as, a, as an indicator. But, uh, Obviously, if you wanted to, to gain more information, especially in clinical neurophysiology, you need to use uh, other techniques that are substantially invasive and based on the intramuscle EMG, either using needle or fine wire um, uh, probes. With this technique, in a clinical setting, uh, it's possible to investigate the motor unit disease, myopathy, alteration of the neuromuscular junction, among the others. And uh, in this way, you can analyze the behavior of the, mod the model unit, the recruitment, but uh, the, the, the discharge rates. But these techniques, again, is limited to small muscle and to a reduced number of model units. And another limitation that uh, is shared also with the traditional surface TMG is that this analysis is usually done in the time domain. So in, as the signal is analyzed as a time varying signal. So uh, this is a, is a limitation that now has been uh, overcome by the introduction in the last uh, 20 years, more or less, of the high density MG. So the use of a grid of electrodes that, uh, with the 60, 80, hundreds of electrodes, depending on the muscle size, that you can um, apply on the muscle of interest. And this way, you 
you can gain not only the time varying signal analysis, but also spatial sampling of the signal. In this way, you can extract the, uh, in a simplistic way, the signature of the model unit, that is the firing rate. And in, uh, with this technique, uh, therefore, it's possible to look non invasively on a large uh, proportion of the, of, the, um, of the muscle, the model unit recruitment, and the recruitment analyzing, for instance, the threshold at which the model unit is, uh, is uh, activated, the discharge rate of the model unit, the, the conduction velocity. You can analyze also the action potential waveforms. And then, if you want to be more sophisticated, also to extract the common synaptic input to the model neural pool. Uh, but uh, in terms of clinical, I think the analysis of the recruitment and the discharge rate is very important. In fact, uh, another feature that has been uh, recently uh, put uh, clear is that it's possible in some condition with the, you know, with the knowledge of the technique uh, to, uh, to follow the same model units across time. This can be done, for instance, um, by looking at the effect of a training intervention, or as indicated in this uh, example uh, made by Del Vecchio and co workers Del Vecchio will present uh, just uh, after me. Uh, you can establish the same model unit you can follow. For, uh, and this example, for instance, indicate that this is possible. These colors refer to the same model units before and after four weeks. Uh, and then, uh, because of the shape substantially was the same, and also the correlation between the recruitment threshold after and before gave a very substantial an identity, 0.99 in terms of the recruitment. It was, it was clear that this indication to, to be able to follow the same model unit is, is crucial in, in many important uh, situations. So we can uh, look at model units, recruitment, the recruitment, we can use a fine rate, non-invasively on large model uh, muscle sample. For instance, we start, uh, this is a very preliminary, we just collected, we collected this data last week uh, in our lab. We, we start uh, looking at the effect of a unilateral limb suspension, 10 days. And these are preliminary data from our uh, laboratory. We are uh, quite, as I said, we are not as good as uh, Dario in, uh, in analyzing the data and presenting, but these are preliminary data. And you see, these are before and after 10 days of unilateral limb suspension. 10 days were sufficient to reduce muscle strength and we see more than 20%. These colors are not referring to the same model unit. Don't be confused. I'm not too weird. We didn't reach this kind of proficiency yet. These are just model unit measured from the vastus lateralis muscle. What we can say, the steadiness was also altered by this uh, limb suspension. We are collecting also muscle biopsies for this study. And then uh, next time I will present the more complete set of data and analysis. But let's now go back to my main point was to, to show very recent example of application of this technique into the clinical uh, field. This is a study uh, done by a group of uh, Japanese, uh, the, with the, uh, we know Watanabe and others, um, that uh, were uh, studying the Charcot Marie II disease, especially one of the uh, most frequently uh, present uh, genetic disease that uh, in, in this patient, uh, um, there is a, a, an alteration that can be uh, affecting the, the neuromuscular response, but uh, that can, uh, can be, the diagnosis of this, this can be uh, delayed, and therefore is a, the effort is to try to identify technique that can um, guarantee a very early di diagnostic. And then in this, in this study, which compare uh, people affected by the condition of the most frequently uh, present is the, the Ch uh, Charcot Marie II 1A, were match versus uh, 21 individual uh, healthy, but uh, force match. They were actually older people. In order to have people force match, they had to be uh, older. And then what they found that um, using ramp contraction, uh, that increasing force contraction at 2% MVC per second, they found that you know, at all level of the ramp, the, uh, the Charcot Marie II patient presented the lower uh, firing rate of model units. 
And uh, this was also evident during a sustained isometric contraction last uh, 120 seconds. After one year, the subject were called back, they were repeated, the, the, some of the measures were repeated. And although the disease severity score and the muscle strength did not change significantly, the motor unit firing rate declined. So to indicate that the motor unit uh, firing rate could be a, an indicator of the gravity of the disease that is non-invasive that can be also repeatable, obviously. This is, a, a, is a, the first study I wanted to, to, to show you. These are the results after one year uh, of, the, uh, of the progression of the disease. This is the average uh, values of the firing rate. Another, another interesting elegant study was done, uh, again, this is again Japanese that are in, uh, interested in this area that from uh, in Parkinson disease. Parkinson disease is a disease characterized, especially at the onset, by a high degree of asymmetry. Uh, this patient present one side that is more affected than the other. So they, based on this uh, point, the others hypothesized that uh, by comparing the two sides of the body, they could identify alteration motor unit behavior that could characterize the, the, the disease. And in fact, uh, indeed, this was proven true because uh, they found these are the control group left side, right side, the no differences. This is the Parkinson's disease group, which the more, the more affected side, in this case, present a higher firing rate uh, compared to the, to the um, less affected side. And then uh, this also uh, was evident when they use a different uh, recruitment uh, threshold. When, uh, you, uh, you, when they also correlated the, uh, the score of the disease, the unified Parkinson disease rating scale, they found that the, the, on the less affected side, the, there was no correlation between firing rate and the score, whilst this was uh, quite clear, a relationship in my, uh, mean firing rate and the score on the more affected sides. So uh, in Park Parkinson patient exhibited a laterality of motor unit behavior and abnormality even when the, the symptoms were mild. So, so indicated that again, this technique can have, can have some application as an early biomarker of the condition. The final uh, study I, I like to present to you is a study done uh, using not uh, active uh, contraction, but the passive uh, recording. This was uh, done on the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And then in this, uh, in this study, the author look at the potential of uh, using the fasciculation potential as an early biomarker, electrophysiological biomarker of the condition. This is important because the, in the uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, the, the diagnosis is, is very uh, delayed. Uh, on average, it is um, 12 months after the onset of the symptoms. So consider that the, the condition got the very short uh, lifespan so it's important to, 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 to make a diagnostic as early as possible in order to operate some therapeutic intervention. Um, so they, they, the others, again, they start from the point that they could use the high density MG on a large surface on strong muscle that are more prone to uh, exhibit fasciculation in the case of the, of the condition. And also because of the non-invasive nature of the, of the application allowed for long, uh, long recording um, uh, duration of, of the long, long duration of the recording about they using in this uh, circumstances 30 minutes of uh, duration and they recorded from the biceps brachii. What they found the main results was the, the uh, fasciculation frequency was the main indicator of the condition was very significant uh, related to, the, to the, um, the condition. These are the three groups analyze, analyze one uh, neurological uh, condition, non, uh, non uh, ILS, and the other were the healthy control. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, the importance of the fasciculation frequency was highlighted also by using the receiver operating characteristic analysis that showing that the only marker uh, that was the, uh, really giving high sensitivity or detection of the condition was the uh, firing frequency as indicated in this, um, 
in this graph. So in summary, I, uh, we can uh, reiterate again that the uh, high density MG can provide uh, non-invasively a new array of opportunities in the investigation of uh, uh, neuromuscular control in both healthy uh, and uh, disease individuals. Can be repeated over time, not being, being non-invasive and uh, allows uh, to follow the same model unit over time, difficult but possible that is demonstrated by other uh, authors. Um, the recent studies uh, also seems to indicate, I mean, to give some, uh, um, some hope that some of these uh, HDMG uh, parameters, especially the model unit uh, firing rate uh, or the use of fasciculation frequency can, uh, can use as an early marker of the, of the uh, in some uh, clinical condition. Um, and uh, I have to say that it's not uh, all, not everything is pinky because the, it's a technique still uh, difficult to use for non, um, non specialists, especially in engineering. But uh, I think that the, the situation is improving by the day. And then I'm, I'm sure that this will, will be more and more applied in the, next, uh, in the next years. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Giuseppe. Um... It was perfect in time, actually, leaving uh, a few spare minutes uh, for um, questions or comments. Are there uh, questions for uh, Giuseppe? Um, yes, I have one, Darian. Yeah, please, Roger. Uh, Giuseppe, in the study on the Parkinson's patients that you shared with us, um, so Parkinson's disease, as we know, is a basal ganglia disorder. And yet what they found were um, changes in the uh, discharge characteristics of the motor units. Did they offer any interpretation of the underlying physiology as to why a basal ganglia disorder might be manifested as changes in motor unit activity? No, actually no. I, I was also puzzled by the fact that, you know, as you notice that the alteration was an increase in motor unit firing rate. Was not the... I mean, I'm not an expert of Parkinson's disease, but I was, I don't know, by reading the paper, I was expecting a decline. Actually, they, they observed an increase in motor unit firing rate in the, in, on the more affected side yeah. of the body compared to the other. But they didn't offer a, a real interpretation of this, this phenomenon. And then, uh, I mean, I, I wonder if you have any, uh, you, uh, any interpretation for this. I think it's important, uh, as Dario pointed out in his talk, that you know, with this new technology that we take the opportunities to try to get to the underlying physiology, for example, is it changes in the biophysical properties of the motor neurons in the spinal cord, or is it telling us something about uh, adaptations in the descending input to the spinal cord? Um, I think those are the kinds of advances that we should be looking for. But it's, it's interesting and it just, provides an opportunity for more work, for sure. No, no, I think the, the, the main is that these papers are very recent, as you know, this was 2021 20, or 20, and I got the impression that are, in some regard, are very preliminary. Yeah. So in, in a specific, in a special population, so there's still space for, for, for improvement, definitely. Yeah, yeah, thank maybe, you. Sorry, maybe one comment that uh, could be done following up on, uh, or Roger's comment is that uh, we really need, uh, I mean, now these techniques are becoming quite uh, fashionable and uh, it's true that they require a bit of specialization, but at the same time, they can be applied uh, in a much simpler way than, uh, for example, intramuscular recording. So that means that uh, there are really a lot of words coming out, but the, the main aspect, if we can gain more from these approaches uh, um, with respect to uh, to other methods. So one aspect that is relevant is uh, the population analysis, the, the fact that uh, high density MG may allow to decode uh, more motor neurons concurrently with respect to more selective techniques. And the population analysis allows to study some of the pathways that are responsible for the output of the motor neurons. So the, 
the, the output of the motor neuron as a population is different from what one could look at the individual motor neurons, uh, mainly because uh, the individual motor neurons is a nonlinear um, uh, operator, we can call it, while the population uh, is uh, partly not. So I, I think it's important, it's just a comment, it's not a question. It's important to uh, look for uh, underlying mechanism, physiological mechanism that we can investigate now and that couldn't be investigated before and trying to refine the techniques, not only in terms of the composition, which was uh, your question, Giuseppe, before, but also what we actually extract, what do we understand about the underlying physiology once we have a set of uh, spiking activities. 